He's a professor of mathematical statistics at the University of Cambridge, uh, where he's also a fellow of Queen's College. So you uh, probably uh, know him uh, for his awarded textbook on nonparametric statistics, where you can learn everything you want to learn about empirical processes and their use in uh, statistical application, probably even more than what you want to know about them. Uh, so um, Richard is an expert in uh, uh, nonparametric statistics, uh, infinite dimensional statistics, and he's made a broad range of contribution uh, within this field, including uh, not only estimation, but also construction of confidence sets, uh, non-parametric tests, uh, et cetera. So he's, uh, he's uh, uh, also an expert at establishing uh, frequentist uh, guarantees for Bayesian methods in uh, non-parametric uh, non statistics. So uh, for example, central result in that field is optimal rates of posterior concentration and uh, is uh, uh, recently been interested in uh, statistical uh, inverse problems, in particular, the study of Bayesian methods in those uh, inverse problems, where the goal is to uh, uh, invert, for example, a nonlinear PDE subject to a noisy observations. And today is gonna talk about some computational aspects associated to this question. So take it away, Richard. Okay, thanks so much for the signature introduction. Uh, let me just uh, share a screen here. Um, just a sec. Okay, um, okay, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak here. Um, and uh, I hope, uh, yeah, okay, so I will talk about some recent problems, uh, pro progress and understanding and problems that have to do with uh, a Bayesian approach to a class of uh, um, statistical inference problems that arise with partial differential equations and where some um, sort of Bayesian methods have been actually quite popular in the recent past. Um, really, to start out with, um, we just have a kind of regression problem. So I will start to talk about a concrete PDE example, probably in the second half of the talk. But for the moment, really, in some sense, it's just a nonlinear regression model. Uh, so you have sort of yi, xi data, response and design variables, where the xi typically are sort of a discretization of a, a you know, multidimensional domain or manifold. And then you just have a usual regress, regression equation. Uh, which here we just assume Gaussian noise. And so somehow it's just a regression model where the particular regression function uh, that you have um, depends on the parameter theta that you're interested in, in a nonlinear way. And the nonlinearity is described by a partial differential equation. As I've said, we'll look at some examples later, but for the moment, really, um, that's just a nonlinear regression model. A terminology that you find in this inverse problems crowd often um, is that they speak of a so-called forward map, uh, which really is nothing else than another word for the parameterization of the regression model that you have. So statisticians might want to write g sub theta, where theta is sort of the index of your regression function. They prefer to explicitly acknowledge sort of the mapping that sends the parameter that you want to make inference on into the regression function that you can observe. Um, and typically in these PDE settings, the theta space would be some function space, so it would be infinite dimensional, but in, in, you know, in, in implementation, you make a discretization that can typically be quite high dimensional. So we should think of the parameter space here somehow as a, as a high dimensional Euclidean space that parametrizes a set of functions. And this map G somehow is really a nonlinear map that sends theta into a solution of a partial differential equation. We'll see examples later, but uh, that's sort of the general setting. And, and we want to um, make inference in this model on the parameter theta based on the regression data. Okay, so you know, just to briefly um, sort of, this is, you know, problems of this kind occur throughout all of applied mathematics. Um, the PDEs that pop up can actually be very complex. Um, but for the theory, at least, uh, and also sort of conceptually, there are sort of some basic PDE examples that one can look at. Uh, maybe classical ones come from elliptic PDEs. Uh, you might have heard about the Cardaron problem and elect electric impedance tomography, which is sort of basically what you do uh, when you do what is on, the, on this picture on the bottom left. Um, there is also this whole paradigm of X-ray transforms where you sort of shoot rays through a medium and try to non-invasively image what is inside. Um, in this context, there is an explicit connection to transport PDEs. And then, of course, in a lot of the data assimilation problems and, and uh, other you know, atmospherical science, weather forecasting, you typically are concerned with some time evolution equations um, 
uh, and I'll, I'll yeah, we'll mostly stick for the theory that I will talk here about to elliptic PDs, but the ideas that I will present somehow do generalize to other PDs uh, in principle. Um, I will not talk much about these applications for now because really this is just a regression problem um, that is, you know, even if you're not interested in PDs at all, it creates a class of high dimensional non convex problems where it is sort of interesting to ask uh, what good inference methods should be, both from the point of view of statistical guarantees and also from the point of view of computability. Um, sort of the first, you know, maybe naive off the shelf thing that you could try to do is to just try to minimize some fit. Obviously, this is just a Gaussian regression function. So you know, the likelihood of least squares criterion just looks at a, uh, a square deviations uh, um, that you get from your output the re regression map to the data. Uh, and you will typically want to penalize uh, solutions that are not um, parsimonious enough. So you want to avoid over parameterization. So you could try to minimize a, a penalized least squares criterion like this one. Um, in the very classical setting, you might just consider a very basic penalty that, you know, if theta is a function, you might look at some kind of norm that measures in L2, the size of the derivatives, like a Sobolev norm, or if it's a vector, you could take some ellipsoidal L2 sort of structure that penalizes. You could do a lot of other penalties, um, but the fundamental problem, even though somehow this penalty here uh, is sort of nice and, and convex, um, when the map G, that pops up in the PDE example is non-linear, then you're really dealing with a non-convex criterion function here. And uh, somehow, if you want to run this in a high-dimensional setting, you don't really know whether you can you can find optimizers because obviously, uh, you know, this surface, I mean, it's multi-dimensional, but it could look like something like this. And if you do an iterative method uh, to try to find an optimizer, you might just get stuck somewhere in a local optimal. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't have to explain this um, to you guys, I'm sure. But uh, that's sort of why these problems are, you know, somehow interesting to study in the sort of contemporary data science. Um, um, okay, so people in applied mathematics, of course, these, you know, these PDE applications pop up all over engineering, science, physics. So this is not something that we've decided to study as the first people. In fact, this has been studied at least for 40, 50 years systematically, also in a statistical context. Um, and there has been a very successful and popular approach that tries to somehow avoid the use of optimization based methods, uh, which is uh, have, has been actually around also for already at least 20 years, but which has been popularized in a paper by Andrew Stewart in Axton America. Andrew is in Caltech now um, in computational mathematics, has made himself quite a name also for this approach, where you somehow um, try to draw from a more general class of algorithms, specifically MCMC algorithms. We'll get to this in a moment. But the idea initially is to sort of take a Bayesian view that this parameter theta that you have, well, it might be higher infinite dimensional. So you might put some Gaussian process prior, uh, possibly a discretization of it in high dimensions as your prior measure. And then you just use the typical Bayesian recipe to compute the posterior distribution, um, which of course, you know, it's just base formula. So you get a reweighted version of the likelihood. And, you know, this prior in high dimensions can typically sort of just, um, uh, you know, it's just basically multiplying by this Gaussian potential here. Yeah. Um, so that is what you would do. If you were to now take this literally, initially, you wouldn't do anything new. If you then would try to, for instance, find the maximum a posteriori estimate, so the point theta that looks most likely in the support of the posterior, you would be back precisely in the optimization problem from before, where the penalty choice that you have picked somehow uh, is propagated by the prior choice. Um, so of course, then if you're not convex, you can again not find this optimizer. But if you have the interpretation of the Bayesian method, you can of course resort to other point estimates that you extract from this posterior surface, not just the mode, but you could try to take sort of smoother statistics, such as for instance, just the average um, the posterior mean, which is just the integral, um, well, the mean vector uh, of your high dimensional posterior surface. And if you want to compute this, you can indeed draw from a different algorithmic toolbox, which are not optimization based methods, but MCMC averages. Yeah? Um, well, I'll try to discuss a little bit what kind of guarantees for this approach one can give. Uh, let me first, however, address sort of two popular approaches that people use in inverse problems um, to compute such posterior 
means or uh, quantiles by MCMC. So the target really is to sample from a Gibbs type measure, which up to normalization is basically um, this exponentiated local likelihood function, and then you sort of subtract this uh, quadratic penalty here. And one of the appeals of the methods why these things have been particularly popular in PD inverse problems is that the algorithms that I will write down uh, for you now never require the specification or numerical evaluation of the inverse map, which for PD examples often is much more difficult to compute or even impossible to compute, whereas the forward map typically is somehow solving a, a elliptic PD or something like this numerically, which people can do. Yeah? So, so one of the attractive features here is that you do not have to solve the inverse problem analytically before you run the algorithm, because the algorithm only relies on evaluation of uh, the map G. So let's see how this works in practice. I will run you through two Richard, examples. Can yeah. I ask you a quick question? Just to be clear, this is also a feature of uh, penalized uh, 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 least squares, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, um, yeah. No, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, but but it is somehow. Um, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So okay. So here's one algorithm, like a vanilla algorithm, which is maybe somehow very basic, but it already gives a concept proof on on what you can do. Uh, sometimes called PCN algorithm. Let me not dig into the history of that. Um, this is, if you want to implement this, you do kind of a Gaussian random walk uh, across your parameter space. And that is, you know, for this, you just initialize somewhere and then you draw a Gaussian proposal. So drawing a Gaussian uh, is, is not too expensive. Uh, and then you compute the proposal. Of course, here you wouldn't be doing anything that has to do with the data. You just do a Gaussian random walk uh, jumping around. But then you accept the proposal in a way that depends on the data. So it's like a metropolis hasting adjustment of this Markov chain, where um, the way you accept the proposal or not is determined by a likelihood ratio test. So you compare the log likelihood function of the proposal to the previous um, to the log likelihood at, at the previous point. If you increase the log likelihood, you're always going to have something that is greater than or equal to zero. So the exponential will be greater than one. So you always accept it. So if you kind of find a point that is proposed that is more likely, you will always accept it. But unlike an optimization method, when you find a point that decreases the likelihood, then you will still accept it with a certain probability. So this allows you to you know, not get stuck in a local optimum. You will still keep exploring um, the whole posterior measure. And indeed, you can show uh, by a simple metropolis hastings calculation that if you run this Markov chain, that the invariant measure or the unique stationary measure that pops up uh, for this Markov chain theta k is precisely the posterior distribution. Um, and so um, this is one candidate um, of algorithms that is sort of not using any geometry of the log likelihood function. It just uh, requires you to evaluate the log likelihood function, uh, which of course you should now think again that the log likelihood function is just the least squares fit. So each step in the MCMC here requires one evaluation of the G map. Um, the other algorithm, which I will mostly be concerned with in the second half of this talk, is um, uh, based on gradient ideas. Um, so actually, maybe it's easier to start with a continuous type object. If you know a bit of uh, stochastic differential equations, you can take a, a STE, uh, a diffusion process, which is sort of a Brownian motion with a particular drift, where the drift that you construct is the gradient vector field uh, obtained from the log posterior. So this is a way to construct a diffusion process. And uh, this sort of an exercise in stochastic calculus that the invariant measure of this continuous time diffusion process is precisely, again, the posterior measure. So if you can you know, sort of discretize this process, this will give you another approximate way to calculate um, the posterior distribution. And if you discretize it, you get something that, if you've ever seen stochastic gradient dis descent might look familiar, even though if it's not exactly the same. So the discretization of this process is again, well, you initialize somewhere and then each step in your high dimensional space is sort of determined by a step size delta and the gradient vector coming from the posterior. So that's where the data enters. And then you add some Gaussian innovations that sort of, again, here, the variance of the Gaussian innovation does not scale with K, so it does not decrease. So again, this process keeps exploring the entire posterior surface and is not trying to get stuck at an optimum. Okay, of course, one has to prove that this is indeed the case, but, um, and in particular, this method, because the continuous time diffusion is called the Langevin diffusion, is sometimes called the discretized Langevin algorithm. And 
of course, the discretization in principle incurs a misspecification of the invariant measure because only the continuous time process has this invariant measure. And when you discretize, you change the invariant measure, but you might still choose not to adjust for it. Um, and so this is called the unadjusted uh, discretized Langevin algorithm. Uh, both algorithms are commonly being used in, in Bayesian inverse problems with PDEs. Um, and so, of course, I mean, this paper by Andrew Stewart has, has lots of citations and, and, and there are many other people working on this. So the question is, of course, as statisticians now, what can we give in terms of guarantees for such methods? Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, that's sort of recent work I've been involved in. Um, and there are really two kinds of questions you can ask. One is, um, well, okay, fine. Let's say I can compute the posterior distribution by some Markov chain. Is this posterior measure a good reconstruction of my nonlinear PD type inverse problem in the sense that the posterior mean has a very good statistical reconstruction properties and very small recovery error uh, if I get more and more data, even in high dimensions. So that is sort of a question of a statistical guarantee. And the other question, of course, is, well, even if I have somehow proved that the posterior measure is a good thing that solves the, the problem, of course, then what I use on my computer when I implement it is still an algorithm of this kind. We have some MCMC dynamics. So the question is, do the statistical error bounds that you obtain carry over to the, to the actual Markov chain you run to compute things. And so, um, okay, so let me uh, talk quickly because it's important for the second part about the statistical guarantees, um, which, I mean, this, this, uh, the question you can ask, and Philippe said this in introducing me, is, well, okay, there is this posterior measure which is a random measure because it depends on the conditioning event on the data. And you could ask yourself, well, if I believe that my data here actually comes from a ground truth theta naught that has generated the actual statistical sample, then I could ask myself, does this posterior measure perhaps somehow collapse towards a Dirac measure around this true value in the sense that, that we would call consistency. And then not only do I want it to collapse towards such a Dirac measure, but perhaps I want to quantify the rate at which it contracts. So this is what we call a posterior contraction rate in some norm that I don't specify here yet. Once you have that, you can ask more. You can ask, well, okay, the posterior measure is, is what contracts, but that's not what you compute, what your MCMC targets. Your MCMC targets typically the posterior mean. So you can ask next step, this posterior mean, which is really a different animal from an optimization-based method in these nonlinear settings, does it actually recover this ground truth, again, possibly with a rate, as my data becomes more informative? So these are typical questions that statisticians in Bayesian theory would ask. And the trouble here is that for these PD models, uh, this is sometimes a bit difficult to prove um, because you have to sort of incorporate the inversion step into uh, sort of the commonly used tools that, that people use, like the book by Goshar and Van der Waat that appeared a few years ago. Um, so that's something I've been working on recently, but that's a bit maybe last year's music. I still want to say this, um, or last year's news. Uh, there were some theorems that we proved for particular PDEs where you can get such rates. Yeah, so for instance, the first result of this kind was on certain nonlinear X-ray transforms, um, which are, have to do with transport PD. So we got the polynomial rate here. Um, for the Cardavon problem, you can show that you can only get logarithmic rates. If you know these PDEs, this will tell you something. Otherwise, just forget about it. Uh, you kind of get rates that are reflecting maybe non-parametric rates that you would expect in inverse problems. Okay, so, and actually really, the starting point of what I'm going to ask now is that probably more like maybe one and a half years ago, I was in Oberwolfach and there was Philippe and Anko Moitra and uh, Francis Bach and a few others. And I was talking about these consistency results and uh, they were sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, debating whether these statistical guarantees that I'm giving here actually translate into computable guarantees because of the lack of convexity. Um, there had been some computational guarantees for these MCMC schemes before. There's a paper by Martin Heyer and Andrew Stewart and Sebastian Forma that I will mention a bit later. So my off-the-shelf answer was, well, there's this nice theorem by uh, Heyer and Stewart and like, you know, they're famous people. So that has to tell you that computation is possible. But then on second time looking at it, I realized that, that in particular in these high information asymptotics, when n goes to infinity, one has to be careful in claiming that things are actually computable. Um, and so, now, one and a half years later, I can uh, maybe give a more satisfactory answer. Um, so really the question we're trying to, to ask here is, if I run my MCMC scheme 
and not just the theoretical posterior measure, can I say something about the recovery? So for instance, can I prove statistical consistency not for the posterior mean, but for the actual ergodic sample average that my MCMC outputs uh, to me? And uh, there are some results that we obtained, which are on the archive. Um, this is jointly with uh, my PhD student, Sven Wang, who has just completed his PhD and is actually moving to MIT uh, this winter to your department so make good use of him he's extremely clever um, and so there's another kind of guarantees about credible sets confidence sets which i do not have the time to talk about today uh, so i want to dive right into the problem of what we can say about computational guarantees in this uh, non um, sort of non-convex or in the language of the posterior measure non-lock concave uh, case okay so I will give you again, initially some general results where the forward map G is not specified. And then at the end, I will try to, um, you know, talk you through a concrete PDE for which we can actually prove everything and, and make things work. Uh, but the main ideas are not necessarily specific to, to this particular PDE and should, could, could even be useful outside of PDE settings. Yeah? And let me again say, so we have a measure we're trying to sample from that is high dimensional. There is a Gaussian potential, so the lack of its lock concavity does not arise from the penalty from this, from the prior, but it comes really from the likelihood from this term here, because again, let me recall that the G of theta map is nonlinear. And so the question is, is it possible to actually generate reliable samples from this measure or, you know, compute with reasonable computational cost um, this posterior uh, measure? And of course, I can't evaluate ln theta and that, so in a way, the proportionality constant, as always in Bayesian methods, is, is sort of the issue that I have to compute a d-dimensional integral of that function. Can I ask a quick question, Richard? Sure. Uh, so here you're going to, so the question about, say, uh, posterior concentration, you're going to abstract out at this point. It's just going to be, I have a posterior and I'm trying to sample from it and compute the posterior expectation. Well, initially, yes, but we will see in proving, in, in, in proving that things are computable, we will need to use uh, frequently statistical properties of posterior measures, crucially. Okay. So the consistency okay. results that I used before somehow then are used in the proof to show that these posterior measures don't look as they might look in the worst case for a given data set, but that for average data sets, they actually have much more favorable properties. So, so there's a deep uh, connection behind it, but a priori now, the question is just, can I sample from this thing? Thanks. One question, okay. just about the yeah. choice of the prior. Uh, maybe this is something I, I missed in the beginning, but how is the prior like chosen and, and, and what, what sort of priors are we talking about here? Okay, yeah, good point. So, so typically um, theta would be an infinite dimensional parameter or possibly high dimensional discretized. Um, what people following Andrew Stewart like to do is to take a Gaussian process prior, for instance, a, a matern process prior, where you would think of this reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm that you get here just as a standard Sobolev norm. Um, so this would be Gaussian random fields on your domain or manifold that have a certain, well, that it might be stationary and that they have a covariance function that in the Frey domain is related to polynomial decay. So, so th this is something that people like to use. Um, for the theory that follows now, it's only important that uh, that this is a log concave thing, really. Um, but in, in, in applications, I can, if you look at my papers, if we, we reference the applied people, they like to use Gaussian process priors where the covariance somehow has to do with the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the on the domain on which they are working. So I guess I, I have a couple of questions. I mean, I think probably you're gonna answer some of them, but I mean, I guess these are just things that are sort of on my mind at this juncture. Um, so first of all, so presumably if you're going to get certain types of guarantees for this mixing time, then, you know, you will be able to get plain vanilla optimization guarantees. I mean, through some procedure, um, but you know, one of the things I'm sort of wondering, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll address it, but is the effectiveness of the balance, because a lot of these things, you know, they're quite subtle in terms of what they stipulate about how n and d go to infinity uh, in terms of, you know, the relative order in which you choose them to infinity and also how some of the bounds are effective or ineffective with those parameters. The other thing that I'm, I guess, conceptually confused by is, um, so you made this point that the forward map, you know, you don't need to compute the inverse, it need not exist. So, um, I mean, usually when I think about 
forwards maps when they don't exist, the posterior doesn't have you know some nice concentration necessarily, because you know you get these like uh, equivalent solutions in terms of the likelihood, and you could have like super bad metastability properties on the paths that connect them. Yeah, should, should I answer or do you have another one? No, uh, you know, I mean, you can answer any time. I'm just. I, mean, I think the that's... first question. I'll, I'll give you some rigorous theorems about the scaling in D and N and so on uh, later. So let's maybe take this question later because I will address explicitly how everything goes to infinity in the mixing time and so on. Uh, for the second question, that's a valid point. I didn't mean to say that the inverse doesn't exist. So typically, indeed, as you say, is correct for the theorems that I will prove. You will need a, a quantitative. Uh, amount of injectivity of the forward map. So, so the inverse does exist in principle. Um, but what I meant is that the algorithm doesn't require to numerically evaluate the inverse map. Um, th this is often numerically difficult because, for instance, for the Cardaron problem, this is a famous paper in the Annals of Mathematics that shows injectivity, but that doesn't tell you that you know how to give a reconstruction formula. So these algorithms are quite popular, therefore, in applications because they do not require you to ever think about proving an inversion formula. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's one of the worrying aspects of the fact that you can run the MCMC in principle, even in settings when the forward map is not injective. Yep. Uh, so the algorithm, you can write it down, it will not require you to be injective, which tells you that you cannot trust these algorithms without some analysis. But that's exactly the analysis that I will try to- pursue. Right, but you know, in partial, I mean, you know, also it depends a bit on like how one measures quantitative injectivity because sometimes the proofs for injectivity and the PDE things are actually like pretty ineffective in terms of the dimension. So partially there like can sometimes be like a rubber meets the road issue about, uh, yeah, you know. So, I mean, if you, if you go to these three papers here, uh, here uh -huh. we prove a stability estimate for this nonlinear X-ray transforms. I mean, this is published in SUPAM. So the PDE people found it sufficiently interesting and, and there, you know, there was some work to do. Half of the paper is giving a good, High dimensional and robust stability estimate. In the Cardavon problem, these are classical pure math results, these stability estimates. And, and here in this other example, we also do it in the paper. So, yes, I agree. You need to give a, a, a rigorous notion of quantitative stability of the forward map to prove anything at all. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and this will factor into this, the, what I will show you in, in terms of theorems in the proofs. Uh, and uh, okay, but but this is perfectly, absolutely correct. What you say, there is no off-the-shelf general guarantee that you can deduce from what I'm saying here. If you have a concrete PDE, you will have to study its quantitative injectivity properties carefully. And if you succeed in proving something, then there could be some guarantees, but there is no general guarantee. Um, okay, so so the question again is: now we have this posterior measure, and we want to generate samples that look like this distribution. And then ideally you want to often compute functionals, like maybe where H is some Lipschitz functional on the high dimensional parameter space. So like an average or, you know, a posterior mean vector, which is also an integral. Um, and of course, you know, really, if you think about it before I say this, I can evaluate this thing at this thing. There's no problem. A priori, the problem is the normalization factor here, which is a high dimensional integral. And now, the first thing you could look at what is like go to the numerical analyst what is the worst case deterministic cost to evaluate an integral say of a d-dimensional Lipschitz function and you know there's some uh, two nice books on computational complexity by Novak is a guy in Germany and Wozniakowski at Columbia these are EMS uh, um, European Mathematical Society monographs that so you find much more on it than you want to know, just like in my book, as Philippe said. But the worst case complexity, even if you know a bit of Lipschitz, is, is very not feasible in high dimensions. Yeah? It's, it's worse than ex exponential growth. Now, of course, in principle, since we're doing randomized algorithms here, we're doing Monte Carlo, there's some hope to break such computational barriers. But you're still, in this situation, not able to generate exact samples of this posterior surface or measure. So, so if you're going to do approximate samples, you have to then, as uh, um, was just asked about, you have to track the dependence of all the constants, ideally in a non-asymptotic way. Okay, and so what we will, our approach to con construct such a randomized algorithm will indeed be, as I've introduced earlier, um, MCMC method. So we want to, just as before in these two examples, generate some ergodic Markov chain that targets this invariant measure. And then you can, you know, you just take the, in principle, the law of the kth iterate of your Markov chain after some mixing time will approximate the posterior measure. But maybe more importantly, you will going to use the whole ergodic sample path average to compute quantiles or, or integral functionals like this one here. 
Um, so ideally you want to get guarantees for these kind of path averages of your MCMC chain because you know that's what you compute along the chain anyway. Um, and so, of course, you know, that's the question that was uh, rightly asked by Ankur is that, you know, you have to track if you're going to do high dimensions, how this mixing time and also now after mixing how long you have to run your sum to approximate the integral, you have to track and that what we want to do how it depends on D on N and on epsilon. Where epsilon is the decision the precision level that you prescribe yourself. Okay, so now we'll, I will tell you a little bit what we did about this problem. Yeah? So. Um, you expect, I, I, if you look at our paper, you will find that we, you know, we give you many more references uh, where the hardness of this problem has been discussed. Uh, you know, this in the filtering data simulation literature, there's a nice paper by Van Handel and Rebeschini in the uh, more statistical literature, like Peter Bickel has worked on this recently. Uh, there are some papers by the Berkeley group um, and so on. And you see, you often encounter curse of dimensionality in D. Um, that is maybe not surprising. The other, like particularly given the deterministic complexity result I mentioned earlier, the other problem is that you know you could have this double well situation where where you know maybe you you just as I drew before you you maybe you know you you up here and then your iterative method has to go through this well to get up again. And if the width of this is n, as it is in the log likelihood case, because you know the let me just go back. I mean this is of course uh, here. A sum of n terms, so you expect the the thing up here as you get more and more data to become more and more spiked. Then in this case, this well might take you know it might take you a long time to get out of this local optimum and travel to the other side. Yeah? So so that is another computational complexity issue that you might need not only e to the d but also e to the n many iterations to get anywhere really. To, because if you want to compute the mean, of course you can't just go to the optimum. You have to explore the whole surface all across. Okay, so now, as I've said, when I started working on this in this Bayesian inverse problems literature, people had already obtained some guarantees. So there's a very nice paper um, by Heiger Stewart Forma in the Annals of Applied Probability uh, uh, a few years ago, where they show for this PCN algorithm that I introduced at the beginning, that it has a sort of general spectral gap in Wasserstein sense under some conditions on the log likelihood. Well, it has to have some local Lipschitz properties and you need to get some other bounds. But in principle, the hypothesis they have to not require log concavity of the measure, which is the same as requiring convexity of the negative log likelihood or the least squares criterion. Yeah, so so that was that is sort of the answer I gave Anko and Philippe and so on backstage in Oberfach that look these these super clever people have already figured it out. But if you look, even though this is dimension free, so it works polynomially in D. Um, polynomial time or even you know finite time in principle. Um, it is has this problem that it this PCN, which is just a random walk, if it wants to get through this double well, uh, it will take an exponential time. And so therefore, as your log likelihood gets more and more spiked and the posterior measure gets more and more spiked, uh, you might have to run through this well and it will take you an exponential time in it. So um, that's just what I'm saying up down here. Um, for the Langevin methods, there are some very important papers recently that you may know about by Anna Dallalion and uh, Arnaud Durmus Eric Moulin, where they do show that if you have a log concave measure in RD, but that really means that your unimodal, so this double well situation cannot arise, um, then you can actually solve the posterior sampling problem in uh, polynomial time in dimension. Um, so this would correspond to the case, for instance, when the forward map G is linear and you have maybe some, you know, something about the uh, conditioning number of this, of, of the, of the matrix induced by, then you can give polynomial time guarantees. But our map is not linear, so we cannot apply these results. Um, there have been attempts to generalize this result, for instance, to in this paper, which I think is, is in NIPS this year, um, where they said you only have to satisfy a log Soberleff inequality. Now, of course, if you look at my measure, um, you can in these PD settings, uh, sorry to go back here, you know, so you could think of this as a Gaussian measure which satisfies a log Soberleff inequality and then you perturb it by something. And in fact, in these PD examples, the forward map often is uniformly bounded. So you could view it as a bounded perturbation of um, a measure that satisfies a log Soberleff inequality, which is sometimes there's this holy struck argument, which is you know not difficult to prove actually that then you also have a log Soberleff inequality. But um, the log Soberleff constant scales like e to the supnorm bound for this thing. And this is again growing like exponential in n. 
So this holy stroke bound will not give you will, it gives you something, but again, it gives you mixing times that will bound that will grow exponentially in n. So both the PCN from this paper and also this approach will produce such issues. Um, so the question is, can I break this exponential versus polynomial time uh, barrier? both in dimension and in n simultaneously, which will tell us that we can solve such nonlinear inverse problems, even in the case when the signal is strong um, compared to the noise. Um, and I will tell you some interesting things that I learned trying to answer these questions that Philippe and others asked me back then. Um, that yes, indeed you can, but you need to obviously introduce some more structure because otherwise you would probably be kind of disproving P versus NP. Um, and so there are three ideas, and I'll try to talk you through all of them. One is that these PD models often give you some local curvature. So there is something that you could think of local, local, locally log concave, um, which I will explain what the conditions are um, on the forward map G that you need to, to uh, leverage that. Uh, the second is uh, concentration of measure arguments that will kind of bound high dimensional condition numbers. And the third is related to what Philippe asked that will fundamentally use insights from the frequentist analysis of these posterior measures and show that these posterior measures are not just some difficult Gibbs type measures with a non-convex potential up there, but they are actually with high frequentist probability have very specific properties that you can leverage in the analysis of the MCMC. Okay, so that's sort of the program. Um, but let's go slow. Let's first look at the curvature problem and let's look why when the G map is nonlinear, you do not have local convexity um, or even, you know, certainly not global and not even local. So let's say the likelihood just for one observation um, when n is equal to one, then if you want to, for instance, show that it has some local curvature, you're looking at the, hash, the negative Hessian of the thing. Yeah, so, so that's what we have here. And you just compute it by the chain rule. Of course, everyone will know that. Um, you get this sort of gradient vector field from the linearization um, out the product with itself. And then you have sort of the, the Hessian term. Obviously, if G were linear, then the second term wouldn't be there. Um, now here, if you look at this, there's some hope that the lambda mean, sort of the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix might have some lower bound. It's sort of, you know, has a convenient form, but this thing, there's really a priori no reason why this should have a sign, yeah? Um, because, you know, if you think of why um, up here, that's just G of theta naught plus a Gaussian noise and the Gaussian error can, you know, can be anything. Um, so that is kind of what, what causes your trouble. Uh, and in these PD maps, they are implicitly given. So you can't really say anything about uh, uh, what this Hessian here is. Uh, um, and actually for these PD maps, typically even this Hessian, even without the sign in front will not be uh, uh, positive definite. Um, but now- Richard, are you thinking about this in expectation? I mean, I, I got confused by your remark that you can hope that this rank one matrix has a lower bound on its eigenvalues. Well, are you thinking about the expectation of this matrix? Sure. So that, that's sort of the next thing. So let, let's look at the last expression when I take an expectation under my sampling distribution. Yeah. Um, in this case, well, let me just write this again. This Y here, of course, is again, it's just, as I said, G theta naught plus epsilon. But now if I take the expectation, then uh, this will vanish because it has mean zero. And here I have G of theta minus g of theta zero. So if theta is close to theta naught, then this will be very small. Yeah. So, you know, this is just a quantitative way of saying uh, that you can represent the Fisher information in such a model by just uh, the other product of the first log likelihood derivatives. But if you haven't seen Fisher information, then this is just a direct way to see that. So in particular, at the true point, when I evaluate everything at theta zero, um, I do get basically a quadratic form like that, plus an error that should be small for points theta that are close to theta zero. So in a small neighborhood of theta, if I have what I would call a stability estimate for the linearization over here, in the sense that this scales roughly like the uh, Euclidean norm of V squared, then I would get some average, average under the sampling distribution local curvature, okay? Um, I don't think this is, you know, uh, very original really, um, it's just a, a quantitative way of understanding that you can express second order information near the true value in a statistical model exclusively just through the uh, sort of kind of, you know, Fisher information. So let us suppose, therefore, that our model has such a stability estimate at the linearization level and make this a hypothesis. I will show them how to check this in a PD example so that in a whole neighborhood of theta naught, 
not just at the true point, but by you know regularity or continuity, this should propagate at least into a small neighborhood. I can actually lower bound on average, not for the given data, but on average, um, uh, this conditioning number. Okay, so th that's a hypothesis, and I will verify it for some PD models later. Um, Richard, this like quantitative injectivity you were debating with Ancora is that is that this kind of stuff? No, because this was well, a very good question. So this would be at the level of um, just G. So the, for the to get the global consistency, you need stability of the non-linear forward map. Whereas here, I need stability just for the linearization. So the uh, the gradient, yeah. So if you want, yeah. So so I mean, for for global, you're going to say something like that. Uh, let me write this here, like that theta minus theta zero or something like this is less than or equal up to constants g of theta minus g of theta zero. Yeah. So you can kind of control the distance on the parameter by the implied distance on the forward level. But this doesn't involve gradients. Whereas here, in order to get curvature, I need a stability estimate just for the gradient of G near the true value. Okay, so I'll show you how to prove this in a PD example in a moment. So this is something you can check even in high dimensions on genuine low dimension, uh, high dimensional neighborhoods. Okay, and then you can use concentration of measure and say, well, this is just an average property but it does extend by, you know, empirical process theory and, and, and chaining and, and, and things like that, like, you know, concentration of measure tools, say, uh, from Tarragon's book or from my book, uh, to the actual data log likelihood, to the Hessian of that. So we show that if you have this hypothesis, then for high dimensional models, so where D can now grow polynomially in N for some B that I could tell you what it is, but it doesn't really matter now. Um, for such a scaling, I can actually carry over the the lower bound on the Hessian of the negative um, expected log likelihood to a small neighborhood on the empirical level. So that tells me with high probability, the log likelihood locally near the true point has some curvature under the condition. And that's, you know, empirical process theory. Um, but now, now let's wait for a second. So here's the idea really. Um, what I've just told you is a property that most statistical models should have, that near the true value, because then the Fisher information sort of simplifies to just first order information. If you have the stability of the gradient of the forward map, then locally near the true point, you will have curvature. That is, you know, once the Fisher information has some invertibility properties at the true value, you can expect that to be the truth. This has nothing to do with linear or nonlinear. This is something that we might expect. But then the posterior consistency theorem will tell you, well, you know, that's not just some area where it's log concave, it's actually where it puts almost all its mass. That's what the frequencies prove you. Yeah, so the frequencies tell you, well, this measure might be anything, but actually it puts almost all of its mass precisely in the region where it's log concave. So perhaps what is outside doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, I mean, of course, you have to make this quantitative in a high, high dimensional setting, but I think that's really the insight that when you sample from a posterior measure, it's not just some Gibbs type measure. It is something that has local curvature and puts most of its mass precisely where it has curvature. And then you can try to leverage that from the MCMC uh, point of view. Okay, so of course, this is only working if we can initialize, if I can find this region, because I don't know where theta naught is. Yeah, so if I want to run my algorithm only in the area where I have curvature, then I need to be able to initialize. Uh, for the example I have, we'll prove initialization is possible. Whether you can do warm or cold initialization in MCMC is yet another topic that could take another half hour to discuss. Um, so we'll for now, assume that you can initialize. I'm happy to discuss this if there's time at the end. Um, okay. So now the idea would be to adapt the ideas on Langevin type um, algorithms that exploit local curvature, uh, global curvature to a sort of localized argument. Okay, and so we, you know, you have to start to look at a concrete example at some point if you're trying to do high dimensions. So uh, here is the example we looked at, an example from PDs, a genuine uh, nonlinear PD example with the Schrödinger equation. Yeah, so this, um, you have a boundary value problem, you have some domain or manifold, and then you look at the sort of Laplace equation perturbed by a potential F, um, where sort of uh, F is the Schrodinger potential that you're trying to infer from observations of your PD. Yeah? So you see um, the F will ultimately be the theta, but I still need to parameterize it. But you see a solution of this partial differential equation, which is a basic elliptic PD, so second order linear elliptic PD, but the map that sends F into its solution is nonlinear. Yeah? So there's a nice a famous probabilistic representation of the solution of this PDE, the feynman kutch formula, which tells you that this, if you take a Brownian motion started at the point X in your domain, and then you look at the path integral 
of the of the Brownian motion in this kind here, and you exponentiate against the potential, then this will give you an analytic expression for what the solution of this PDE is. Of course, this doesn't allow you to solve the inverse problem because this is a very complicated path integral, but it, it, it shows you a little bit that this is a genuinely nonlinear problem. Okay, and so F for these arguments to work through has to be non-negative. Of course, I want to apply a Gaussian process prior to it. So a Gaussian measure will not be non-negative. Uh, you, you have to make it positive. So you do this by a link function and you also need to discretize. Um, so what we do is we expand um, the potential F. Well, initially we expand the generic function into the first D eigenfunctions of the Dirichlet Laplacian. This sort of resembles the use of Gaussian process prior Sarah Andrew Stewart, where you kind of deal with covariances that come from, from the Laplacian on your domain. Um, and it is also exactly this matern process priors there of this kind. And then you have to make the thing positive by, you could in the easiest case exponentiate it. For the proofs, it's better to make it positive by a map that doesn't grow exponentially at infinity. But then if you compose the link function that makes things positive with this discretization and the solution map of the PD, then this gives you your whole forward map from RD um, to the space of, you know, twice uh, continuously differentiable functions. So that is the example that I will consider now. Um, so the posterior measure has again this form and we now take a general Gaussian prior, um, uh, which can be represented in any way in this basis with some decay on the eigenvalues. And the first key lemma, which is a PD result that we had to prove is indeed, if you do this with this discretization and with this Schrodinger forward map, you do have curvature in a ball of radius d to the minus four over d around the truth. And you have also a quantitative lower bound on uh, sort of the conditioning number. And it's important that, you know, if you understand inverse problems, we do not in our discretization use the SVD of the gradient here, yeah? Because this gradient of g in this case is a Schrodinger operator, whereas we use for the discretization the standard Laplacian. So this SVD mismatch, that's sort of the main struggle in this lemma that it actually can be made to work, but you do have it. So there is approximate curvature even in high dimensions. Um, so there's some hope for this program from earlier to go through. Um, sorry, okay. what, is this, what is small d again? Oh, sorry, I missed that part. Oh, sorry. So little, yeah, so big D is the dimension that matters. Little d, so is the Schrodinger equation is posed on a manifold um, that has dimension little d. Yeah, so, so, you know, this is a boundary value problem and uh, the dimension of this domain where you kind of, so if you want your function f is a function on a d-dimensional manifold, and then you discretize it in a capital d-dimensional basis expansion. But the little d is, is like one, two, or three, basically, yeah? um, in our theory. Okay, so you do have this curvature, and it is really in this PD model, so you're, not, you're really not nonlinear, but you do have the curvature. Okay, so now I want to give you the theorems. Before I write down the algorithm, let me first give you a theorem in principle about the polynomial time computation of, um, of, of the posterior mean vector, okay? So our target is to compute a d-dimensional vector, which is the posterior mean in this Schrodinger model. You need some assumptions, for instance, that the model dimension has to not grow faster than polynomial in n. Um, and the, uh, the true vector theta zero needs a bit of regularity uh, in a Sobolev sense. I can write down exact things in a moment. But then this d-dimensional integrated vector can be computed at precision epsilon in Euclidean distance by an algorithm, which is an MCMC algorithm. And the number of iterations you need to run your algorithm in terms of point evaluations of the forward PDE, which is a Schrodinger equation, which can be done by standard numerical methods like finite elements or so, has a computation time that is polynomial in all the key parameters. So both in N and in D and in inverse epsilon. So this is something that I think for PCN, and uh, other methods will not hold true. Um, but of course, we leverage local curvature of the problem here, yeah? Um, let me just show how the algorithm works. It's basically uh, unadjusted, unadjusted Langevin, but we tweak, so you initialize somewhere, we prove initialization is possible for Schrodinger again in polynomial time. Um, and then you take your likelihood, and when you go outside of the area of curvature, you just basically truncate it in a way that doesn't destroy local convexity. And then you add a very sort of uh, negatively convex potential. Um, so you kind of outside of the area where you know that you're convex, you force your algorithm to pretend as if it's sampling from a log concave measure and forces the, um, 
Langevin diffusion back because then you just do gradient descent, uh, well, sorry, uh, unadjusted Langevin with this surrogate potential that you've convexified outside of your region. Yeah, so I should say, even though the region is small in radius where you're convex, for the step size you pick, it is still a huge high dimensional expanding space. So the fact that this will mix um, is not at all obvious. Um, so you do this convexification argument, and the main theorem statistically is the following, which goes to what uh, Philippe was asking, is that we can actually show that this brute force convexification, this gives me another surrogate posterior measure, which I have to renormalize by something else, because I've tweaked here everything to be strongly log concave. Actually, in Wasserstein distance is overwhelmingly close to the actual posterior. And that's a quantification of the statement that I said earlier that actually, even though posterior measures in non-convex settings might be in principle very rough, they actually put all their mass into a region where they are locally log concave. And so we can indeed show the posterior density actually has a unique mode. This is something that follows from the theory. The measure, the circuit measure is globally log concave. So I can sample very quickly from it using the Dallalian durmus moulin And the Wasserstein error I make in sampling from the wrong target is not just small, it's even exponentially small, um, where alpha is the regularity of your true theta zero. Yeah? Um, I was very surprised that this is somehow a non-asymptotic version of a Bernstein von Mises theorem, where you kind of say, you know, Bernstein von Mises theorems typically say that you converge to a normal, that the posterior converges to a normal, but but that's an asymptotic theorem, but this here is not asymptotic. This is for every n with high probability on the data. And um, tells you in a way something surprising that when you sample from posterior measures, you can expect them under some conditions like that the gradient of the, lin like the linearization has some stability. You can expect that you're always sampling from something that is locally log concave and all the mass sits in that region. And uh, okay, so just the last two minutes to give you some co concrete theorems. So we can sample at precision levels that they could be exponentially small, but we want to give polynomial time bounds. So we assume them to be polynomially small in inverse sample size. We can choose the step sizes of the uh, Langevin in a way that you know you have to make some choices. They're all polynomially in, in the parameters. Of course, these are still, we don't care about explicit constants. The dimension cannot grow faster than n to that power. And the regularity of the truth theta zero has to be at least something, you know, that, that's these are strong conditions, but they're not completely crazy. Um, and then let's compute, let's let's look at this as the sample average of an er ergodic uh, of, of the Markov chain that comes out of your thing, and then you get the following bounds. So you can, after mixing time that again scales polynomially in the key parameters, recover the expectation of this Lipschitz functional by the sample average of the Markov chain. You can do the same with the posterior mean. And even more so, you can combine it with the statistical consistency result and tell you that actually after j iterations of your uh, Langevin discretization, um, discretized Langevin algorithm, you're actually not just close to the posterior mean, but you're close to the true ground truth that generate the data. Yeah? So this is a, both a computational and a statistical guarantee. And the error bounds here, again, if you run your iterations in a polynomial time in the key quantities d and epsilon, you will get exponential decay to zero. And we also have a mixing time bound um, for the actual laws of the d-dimensional posterior measures, again, with the polynomial explicit in all these parameters, uh, mixing time. And if you want this based on a proof of a spectral gap of this size. Um, so just to wrap up, I think the, the interesting bit here is, I mean, in the end, from an MCMC perspective, we mostly leverage these strong results about what you can do under convexity from Dallalian, Durmus, and Moulin. But I think the main insight is to say that in a lot of situations, you shouldn't treat the posterior measure as a given the data deterministic object that you try and sample to trying to sample from, but you should realize that actually it has some very favorable properties expressed actually in local curvature. Okay, so um, I think the main thing I talked about here is the first paper here. If you're interested in this consistency um, uh, results, which are really crucial in the quantitative proofs underlying this Wasserstein approximation, then you can check them out here. And this credible set confidence story that I didn't have the time to is in the in the last paper. Uh, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, you can unmute yourself rather than uh, typing uh, long uh, remarks. So, if you have a question, uh, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask it. If you cannot, just let me know in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, chat. In the meantime, I have a question. So if I take any C3 function, 
uh, I'm going to be locally convex around the maximizer, right? Or locally concave around the maximizer. Right, so so right. I mean, I can just uh, and and in a way, there's this is not really to the fact that uh, uh, you know this is the expectation is the KL and the KL is a, like is like you have to make this additional assumption that things are actually strictly uh, concave in this maximizer. So I guess the, the the main question, and and then I could just unfold everything a condition on having a good initialization. So the question that I have is. Can you tell us a bit more, like what does the initialization look like for the particular problem you have? And the other follow-up question is, if I start from this initialization, since I'm in the region of strong con concavity of your log likelihood, can I just run gradient descent there and uh, a gradient descent and just get to the map? Yeah, so we so let me, the last question is uh, the easiest to answer. So we proved this in the paper as well, that if you do standard gradient descent after initialization, uh, you will compute the map also in polynomial time. So, so this is also, so I'm not saying here, ultimately uh, that MCMC works and optimization doesn't. I'm just saying under the structure of this particular problem, both work. Um, but of course, MCMC methods are attractive also for other purposes like uncertainty quantification and so on. About your first question, um, I think you cannot in general expect MCMC to provide a valid initializer. Um, so, you know, um, you do think that you have to do an extra thing to initialize. Uh, and before I answer your question about how we initialize, uh, you shouldn't forget that even when I initialize, um, I'm still in a very high dimensional region here. And the step size of the Langevin scheme compared to the radius of the ball in which I'm lock on cave is sort of very small. And I still, so it will happen sometimes that the that the Langevin process gets out of this region of convexity. And somehow the fact that the number of times that this happens before you come back doesn't um, harm, your, um, harm your recovery and mixing time is some of the crucial contribution of this Wasserstein bound. So I think that this sort of very kind of brute force and locally concave in any case, uh, and locally low concave in any case argument I can see your intuition, but I, I don't see how to make it quantitative because you need to be able to say that most of the mass sits in the right region. Um, but yeah, so, so I think about initialization, that's a very hard problem. For most PDEs, you have to understand the, the range of the nonlinear forward map, which people don't understand. Uh, for the Schrödinger equation, we do understand it. So we just do a standard regression at the forward level and then project onto the range of the forward map. And you can do this in polynomial time. Uh, is somehow not a solution that extends to other PDs uh, at all. So, um, you know, putting on my like complexity theory hat, I guess. So um, I think for like general MCMC things, that's what you said is exactly right. That actually one of the places it's not usually talked about in like these types of applications, but one way functions are really the sort of killer because, um, you know, they produce likelihood profiles where, I mean, you can have lots of nice convexity properties locally, but you end up with this needle in a haystack problem of finding the region to begin with. But, you know, so to me, one of the interesting things is also, you know, it was a great talk, trying to figure out, um, you know, what PDEs one can and can't do it. So I have to confess, I have less intuition about Schrodinger, but, um, you know, one of the parallels that I think is worth drawing is the things like learning mixtures of Gaussians, where you can think about these as, you know, inverse problems or inference problems under the heat equation. Mm -hmm. Now, the difficulty there is that, you know, we know sort of tight upper and lower bounds, especially under parametric assumptions for how many components they are, but things like the smoothness or, you know, Sobolev norm of, you know, but are not enough statistically to learn the parameters. So, you know, what would be interesting is like, A, trying to test out, um, you know, some of these things. Like I think, you know, building general theory is great, but then like for me, a lot of times I have like concrete questions where then I try and, you know, match if there's a gotcha or not. But the mixtures of Gaussians are really tricky because there, there are genuine information theoretic lower bounds that parameter identification is impossible unless the number of samples is exponential in the number of components. And you know, your Gaussian sampling model, a lot of those things are not all that different. I mean, you can translate between the sampling models if you're in low dimensions, 
because they're all sort of equivalent under like kernel density estimates and I can simulate one from the other. But, you know, my sense is that it would be a violation of the quantitative injectivity because, you know, even though you can uniquely look at the shape of a mixture of Gaussians, if you had perfect knowledge, the lower bounds in terms of identifiability tell you some limitations to identifiability. But the other interesting thing is that there are questions in the space that are possible. So like it's not known that uh, whether or not you can do proper density estimation in avoiding the exponential in K in the number of components. So even though, you know, like the, um, you know, your radius where the things are locally convex is this capital D to the, you know, minus something in little d, that's not such a big deal in those settings. But, um, you know, it would be interesting to see whether, you know, like how the different assumptions relate to these concrete questions. It's possible it's a difference in the Schrodinger versus heat equation for these things too, because the dissipation properties for Schrodinger are like wildly different uh, in terms of like the, the PDE, you know, understanding the energy dissipation and stuff. Yeah, I mean, th th I think everything you say is absolutely right. I'm not saying that we have an absolutely general theory that will solve anything. In fact, most of the paper is trying to check all these things for Schrodinger equation. I mean, the Schrodinger equation is representative of a large class of inverse problems that pop up, like Laplacian plus potential. You can write a lot of inverse problems somehow in this way. Um, and uh, so, so it does, I think, have a meaning in applications. But it is at the same time, uh, from a PDE perspective, somehow a very favorable situation where everything works your way. And uh, I'm in no way claiming that, that you expect the same um, favorable situation at the Afro Schrodinger to extend to all sorts of other PDEs. In fact, I suspect for a lot of PDEs or, or like Gaussian mixture problems, you, you might not have enough stability for the linearization to prove what I just proved. But it gives you at least one constructive way to prove such things. And it, it is super interesting to investigate other settings. So I think uh, like a natural crit, uh, PDE to also be optimistic about, you know, if the Schrodinger works out this way is the wave. But, sure. you know, and like, but then you have like various like box wave equations and like higher dimensions too. So, I mean, you know, there's and, a book by, by like uh, some Russians and Mati Lassas, which is called Inverse Spectral Geometry or something like this, where they kind of prove in this book uh, that, that a lot of these nonlinear inverse problems can somehow be reduced to a Schrodinger type problem, a wave equation, even some heat equations. So, um, it's, it, you know, you can check it out, but I have to say, um, I think it's something that I would initially do problem by problem because, uh, I mean, for Schrodinger, we have to work like, so, you know, the paper is not short and, and, and you have to check it for your PD. So I can't, uh, I can't give a general answer, but obviously, you know, in the finite time we have available, we will be very interested in exploring other uh, settings and, and mixture models are certainly very interesting. And actually when Sven comes to MIT, just uh, maybe we can chat to you a little bit about these prospects. Uh, All right, we're a bit over time, so I think uh, it's time to probably wrap it up. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for a great talk and generating all those discussions. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Great, thanks. And if anyone has questions, just shoot me an email. Yeah, I'm happy to take uh, any. Good to see you.